So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socioeconomic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service True Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or a teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERPI has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <sighs> Pag nanguli tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ang isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isa ilalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. 
ang PIDS, ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang mas sigurong matugunan nito ang socioeconomic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas ipetid! What is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socioeconomic think tank. conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Service Through Policy Research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERP is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERP has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <sighs> Pag nanonood tayo, wala tayong may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na sa mga mamamayan 
eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isailalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. Dito po mapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS, ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan, na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the PIDS webinar series. We are glad that you could join us today, and we hope that you are safe and in good health. I'm Sheila Sierra, and I'm the moderator. This afternoon, we are receiving our conversation on the dig digital economy. So last March 11, if you recall, we talked about the rapid ascent of the Philippines and the rest of Asia 
and the opportunities that it brings. Hence, the need to uh, better understand this and size of the digital economy to fully tap its potential. This afternoon, the focus of our conversation will be on the specific issues confronting uh, the digital economy and its participants. So we will talk about the digital divide, uh, social protection, property, and other issues. To officially open our event, I now give the floor to the president of PS, Dr. Celia Reyes. Mangsel? Thank you, Sheila. Good afternoon. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the following. Representative Christopher de Venetia of the 4th District of Pangasinan, Senate Economic Planning Office Director General Ronald Golding and Director Sir Cesni Tafan, from the Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department Director General Romulo Emmanuel Miral Jr., Executive Director Novel Bangsa, and um, Executive Director Manuel Aquino. Department of Budget and Management under Secretary Laura Pasqua and Regional Director Ricky Sanchez. From NEDA, Regional Director Efren Carrion and Assistant Regional Director Bernardino Atienza Jr. Department of Science and Technology, Philippine Council for Industry, Energy and Emerging Technology Research and Development, Executive Director and Paringit. And from the Department of Trade and Industry, Bureau of Trade and Industrial Policy. Director Abigail Zurita, Social Security System President and CEO Aurora Cruz Ignacio, a former PIDS Board of Trustees, former PIDS President Dr. Joseph Yap. And from the private sector, we have Employers Confederation of the Philippines North Luzon President Salvador Cosenio, Social Innovative Solutions Founder and CEO Maria Lourdes Magda. ASEAN Vice President um, Jeffrey Gatula, Philippine Exporters Confederation Assistant Vice President Maria Flor de Isalion, Center for Strategic Research Executive Director Maria Carmen Peñalosa. And from Academe, we have Cagayan State University Vice President for Academic Affairs, President Kawilan, Pamantas ng Lunsod ng Maynila Acting Vice President Evangeline Dubao, Mountain Province State Polit Polytechnic College President Rex Don Chacas, Polytechnic University of the Philippines Head of Academic Programs, Rufo Bueza and Dean Julio Tafuque, Ateneo de Manila University Director Carlos Opus, Asian Institute of Management Executive Director Hamid Paolo Francisco, University of Asia and the Pacific Program Director Jovi Dacanay, Master of Academy Dean Ross Alonso, and from the we also have Unang Hakong Foundation, President Lucas Oli, Senior Inotech Director Ramon Bakani, Center for Art New Ventures and Sustainable Development Executive Director Gigo Alampay, and Freelance Writer of the Philippines Executive Director Maria Fatima Villena. Let me also greet our guests, colleagues from the government, academe, civil society, media, and private sector, as well as those who are watching through the PIDS Facebook page. Good afternoon and welcome to our public webinar. Today's virtual event will feature two PIDS studies, namely online work in the Philippines, some lessons in the Asian context, and digital divide and the platform economy, looking for the connection from the Asian experience. Both studies are from the ADB PIDS Research Project on the Digital Economy. Our first presenter, PIDS Senior Research Fellow, Connie Dakoykoy, we provide an analysis of the patterns of online work in the Philippines within the bigger context of the Asian experience. She will also discuss the challenges related to social protection, skills development, and job security for online workers. Second presenter, PIDS Senior Research Fellow, Francis Kimba, will talk about the extent of digital divide in Asia. He will also relate this to other factors such as culture, trust, and skills. It has been a year since the government implemented lockdowns and quarantines due to the pandemic. If there's one positive effect that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought to the Philippines, that would be accelerating the country's digitalization development. We were forced to adapt to new technologies and adjust to more advanced ways of doing our jobs, running our businesses, buying our needs, and connecting with people. Digitalization is a new normal, and it is here to stay. 
we need to harness its potential and use it to our advantage. According to a recent report of the Asian Development Bank, hazing digital transformation could lead a substantial growth in global output, employment, and trade. The ADB report said that a 20% increase in the size of the global digital sector would increase global output by an average of $4.3 trillion a year from 2021 to 2025. About 40% of this growth would benefit Asia and the Pacific, where the economic dividend would reach more than $1.7 trillion a year during the period. It would also create about 65 million new jobs annually across the region and expand regional trade by $1 trillion yearly through 2025. Based on ADB's um, estimates, an expansion of 20% in the Philippines digital sector from the 2020 baseline by 2025 would result in additional output of $37.6 billion and create 2.2 million new jobs a year. While there is a growing demand for platform jobs in the country, one of the studies to be featured this afternoon noted that around 25% of online workers in the Philippines are still engaged in low value added jobs, such as clerical and data services. It also pointed out that only 14% of Filipino online workers are engaged in jobs related to software development and technology. This is quite low compared to platform workers in India, Pakistan, and Vietnam, with 59%, 45%, and 52% respectively. In terms of digital skills, a second study noted that countries with higher income tend to have a higher number of digitally skilled population. Thus, nations belonging to the lower and middle, lower middle income group will lag behind due to lack of basic computer, coding, and digital skills. In the Philippines, analysis of unpublished data show that most people who have access to computers use them for basic communication, entertainment, and gaming. Only a small portion use the technology for um, use the technology for more advanced tasks, running a software program in data management and analysis. These concerns should push the government to deepen the skills of the Filipino workforce for high-end and high-value platform jobs so that we can participate and compete in the global digital economy. Aside from enhancing our digital literacy, we also need to build our digital infrastructures to improve internet connectivity and accessibility. These are important elements to bridge the digital divide, especially in this time of the pandemic. To give us a broader perspective on the topic, we invited Senior Economist Dr. Kevin Chua of the World Bank and Director George Tardio of the DICT's National Planning and Corporate Management discussions in today's webinar. We thank both of you for accepting our invitation, and we look forward to hearing your comments and insights this afternoon. I'm also looking forward to hearing views from other participants during the open forum. I now give back the floor to the moderator, Dr. Shia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mamsel. Thank you for setting the tone of today's uh, webinar. So, friends, I now invite you to listen to the uh, first speech, which was um, authored which was offered by uh, the following, uh, Dr. Connie uh, Bayudin de Poikoy, Dr. Aniceto Arbeta Jr., Dr. Ramonet Serafica, and, and Ms. Laura uh, Prisbahe. And to present the study is Dr. Uh, de Poikoy. She is a development economist who specializes in gender and family, poverty and social protection, and structural transformation. He is a senior uh, research fellow at PIDS, and prior to joining the institute, he was an assistant professor at the economics department of the Ateneo de Manila University and a consultant at the Asian Development Bank. Dr. Dakoikoy obtained her PhD in economics from Kyoto University. Connie, the floor is now yours. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Sheila. Can you hear? Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, for attending this webinar. Um, uh, but before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, Dr. Arbeta, Dr. Serafica, and Ms. Bae. Um, we've done several work, uh, some work, some work on platform work in the past, and today uh, I will be discussing the platform work within the Asian context. And I've organized the presentation into five key messages. Um, the first one being, uh, next slide, please. 
The first one being that there are um, recent developments that have changed how we live and work. And one of these developments would be the advancements in ICT and digital technology. So now we're familiar with telemigration, virtual migration. Uh, this actually predates way back in the 1980s when companies have started offshore outsourcing to take advantage of talents in low-cost nations. So we know already of BPOs and KPOs. And these outso uh, offshore outsourcing have evolved into work arrangements mediated by digital platforms. Digital platforms, they leverage technology to facilitate two things, work and the organization of work. And by doing this, they bring together uh, markets. So from the perspective of the firms, they now have access to a pool of diverse and geographically dispersed human resources, while individuals, they have now access to economic opportunities that are not available in the local labor market. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the next uh, recent development would be the COVID-19, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, which certainly reshaped uh, our consumption habits. So people are less likely to go to the malls, they are less likely to travel. And these have significant impacts on employment in the micro, small and medium enterprises and the services sector. It also accelerated the digitization of work as companies implement work from home schemes. And the adoption of this telecommuting, uh, telecommuting and virtual collaboration as a new normal will definitely blur the line that separates online and offline work. Uh, and this makes sense because firms will adjust their operations to losses. Uh, therefore, they will um, uh, prefer uh, outsourcing more. And workers will cal calibrate their preferences and evaluate their attitudes towards risk, and they will prefer online rather than offline work. Uh, next slide, please. So I was mentioning earlier uh, platforms. Uh, platforms they facilitate the demand and supply of at least uh, at least the commodities, uh, tangible goods. Uh, as exemplified by Amazon and eBay, non-tangible goods uh, as exemplified by Netflix and Spotify, and labor as exemplified by Grab and Food Panda. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Upwork and Amazon Mechanical Turk. So of these um, three platforms, probably the more uh, controversial or more problematic could be the, the digital labor platforms because these have issues in terms of social protection, skills development, and even decent work. Despite uh, these issues, um, there are uh, uh, advantages, for example, flexibilization of labor markets. So there are two sides of flexi uh, flexibilization here. Uh, the firm ribbon flexibility, one that allows firms to choose from a number of workers to finish short term tasks at a uh, relatively low cost and the worker driven flexibility one that allows workers to achieve work-life balance. Uh, and so here, uh, workers are their own boss and they can do the uh, work anytime, at any time, at any place. This worker-driven flexibility is um, an important selling pitch to women due to the realities of non-market work, like care economy and housework. Next slide, please. So uh, the work done on digital labor platforms are heterogeneous in terms of scope and complexity and in terms of market and reach. So what we did was uh, we came up with this figure just to have a sense of the terminologies available in the literature. And we found that there are at least two types of work, on-demand work and crowd work. On-demand work, uh, this is a work that requires close interaction between workers and de demanders. This is exemplified by um, Grab and Food Panda. While crowd work, uh, this is a work that is commissioned by firms and is transacted transacted and delivered online. Uh, and this is exemplified. And there are two types of work here, macro task and micro task. Macro task, these are long term projects. They require specialized skills, but the and the final price can be negotiated. Micro tasks, these are clerical in nature, routinary, and the contract price is non negotiable. In terms of the typology on economy, collaborative economy and sharing economy are terminologies that are closely associated with on demand work, while gig economy and platform economy are closely associated with crowd work. Uh, for today's presentation, we are focusing more on the crowd work, and then we are going to use platform economy as a matter of terminology. Um, next slide, please. So what have what what have, what have we found out uh, regarding this platform economy? We found that uh, workers they are contractors and self-employed. Uh, they don't have employer-employee relationships, and therefore they have no security benefits or or entitlement. There are also inequalities that are due to asymmetries. 
value asymmetry because the value accrues most to the platform and to the firms and the, the least to the workers. Risk asymmetry because uh, the uh, training investments, uh, social protection coverage, even the production costs are borne by workers. Uh, information asymmetry because all the information is managed and controlled by the by the platform, and if there's information asymmetry, then there's also power asymmetry that's going on there. Uh, another issue is the lack of, lack of collective representation, uh, which is understandable because the workers are coming from different parts of the world, and it would be difficult to uh, come together and organize a labor rights group. And then there's also an issue of discontinuity in employment, because precisely because the work is contractual and short term, and there's really no promise of uh, future engagement. Next slide, please. So as I was mentioning earlier, uh, there are two types of platform work, uh, crowd work and on-demand work. Uh, of, between the two uh, platform work, the more difficult uh, one in terms of uh, enforcing national labor laws would be crowd work because the transactions typically cross borders and it would be difficult. Uh, who are we going to go after in terms of social protection or in terms of uh, decent work or skills development? So really the question about crowd work, about the, this crowd work is how do you make uh, crowd work sustainable and how do you put decent, decent work in it? And then the question is that why do we want to do that? One is that um, uh, Mamsel already mentioned a lot of uh, benefits coming from this. Uh, in the future, it's going to be, probably become a big source of employment, that that's one. Second is that again, it's going to provide uh, opportunities to uh, people uh, which we uh, opportunities which might other which might or might not be available uh, in the labor market. That's one. Second is that um, this kind of work can help uh, the attainment of some SDG targets, uh, especially those relating to women, uh, women empowerment and and uh, gender in gender equality. Um, it's also possible to uh, it's also possible to address the age old conflict between market and non market work. Um, next slide, please. So key message number two, uh, there is a need to create systems for skills and training. Uh, and here we leverage online labor index to show the distribution of online work by occupation. Uh, we can see that in 2020, 50% is in software development and technology, and 20% is in creative and multimedia. Now, uh, there are jobs that are resilient uh, against uh, crises such as the ongoing pandemic, and there are uh, online work that, that have been substantially affected. And um, the work of Stefani last year showed that jobs that are resilient would be jobs that are related to software development and technology, and those that have been sub substantially affected would be jobs that are related to creative and multimedia services and sales and marketing support. Um, and and uh, as we were saying earlier, no sales and marketing. So uh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, next slide. Okay, so here uh, on the uh, left panel, uh, we're showing uh, from the online labor index again, distribution of online work by employer. And we can see that projects are coming from North America, followed by Europe, and some uh, are coming from Asia. This is actually consistent with the earlier models of offshore outsourcing that took advantage of large pool of low cost talents in Asian countries. And in the right panel, we're showing here the distribution of online workers. Um, the, we can see here that um, the blue part would be the uh, software development and technology that would be the biggest. Uh, and the red bar, red bar would be the creative and multimedia uh, services. These are mostly done in Southeast and South Asia, but some are also done in the MENA region, US and the UK. So the takeaway here is that workers from countries with heterogeneous levels of income are competing for the same type of work. And so this has implications on the bargaining power of workers. And in fact, there are already studies that forwarded the idea that Crowd workers in Northern America, Europe, and Central Asia earn more than those in Africa and Asia and the Pacific. And sometimes the dichotomy is between non-Western and Western, where non-Western workers could be poorly rewarded in online work. Uh, next slide, please. 
And the, again, there's another problem which is uh, has something to do with labor oversupply. In uh, this oversupply, uh, as we know, will exert downward pressure on compensation. But more importantly, it again creates a set of challenges on the work uh, to the workers' bargaining power. Uh, and uh, we found that from the 2015 ILO survey of crowd workers, there are uh, issues like delayed communications of um, crucial instructions and getting a failing mark even after following the work requirements and specifications. And from Bangladesh and in Indonesia and Pakistan, they are complaining of un unscrupulous firms who simply did not want to pay. Um, next slide, please. So here again, uh, we showed the uh, the Philippines together with its comparators, and we can see the blue bar again representing the software development and technology. The one that's resilient against uh, crisis would be highest for India, uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan. Uh, and Vietnam. And then the red bar, which is the multimedia and creative and multimedia services, is uh, the highest for um, Indonesia, uh, Bangladesh, and uh, the Philippines. So uh, as we were saying earlier, no, this red bar or multimedia and creative services, these are not as resilient as the uh, creative, uh, sorry, the software development and technology. And one important uh, thing to notice here is the gray bar which represents the uh, data entry and uh, the data entry and clerical services which is actually the highest for the philippines this is around 10 percent uh, so that means that uh, a large portion of online workers in the philippines are still working in jobs that have low value adding um next slide please so having said that, uh, we emphasize the importance of skills development and training support. And this is important for at least two, two groups of people. One group is though for those who consider platform work in their long-term career portfolio. So those who wanted to stay in the, on the platform, uh, the skills development and training support should be able to facilitate the shift from simple and repetitive micro tasks to high value adding macro tasks. Uh, and then um, for people who consider platform work as a temporary engagement, meaning they're just there because they're uh, pursuing other, uh, uh, they're pursuing uh, educa uh, uh, further education or they're just, uh, they wanted to do other, other things, then uh, the experience uh, on the platform can enhance their employability in any type of work arrangement. Now, uh, here, uh, similar to the, probably the issue in, uh, standard work arrangement, work experience is essential in, sec in securing jobs, also on platforms. Those without strong credentials may find it difficult to find uh, opportunities in the platform setting. And this is uh, probably more uh, highlighted now because there are people who are retrenched. There are many people who are retrenched and there are increasing number of job seekers. And these job seekers are, are who, uh, who probably have skills that are, have already been honed from their, their previous platform engagements or have already been developed from their other form of work. And so we have to do something for the Filipino online workers who are still doing some micro tasks uh, so that they can, can compete against the other, uh, other types of workers. Um, next slide, please. So uh, going deeper into this uh, creation of systems for skills and training, um, the important thing that uh, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to emphasize here is that the skills needed on the platform are probably the same skills that are needed in the traditional work arrangement. So these are IT skills, um, inter, uh, internet skills, numeracy, literacy, communication, negotiation. So what we what what we probably need is to have. Uh, a, a stronger, for example, stronger communication skills, stronger nego negotiation skills. We have to be better at marketing uh, and and um, branding our workers. Uh, we, we need to develop, uh, uh, we need to craft training to, so that uh, we can develop uh, complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity. So having said that, the focus should be on the creation of a sustainable uh, ecosystem of skills program and training support. Uh, this system should be useful in any type of work arrangement. It should be used. Uh, it should be able to help both men and women prepare for the challenges brought about by this by the disruptions and uncertain uncertainties in the labor market. Now, um, uh, so 
there is a need for the Philippines to have a national upskilling program. Uh, and then how do we go about doing this national upskilling program? Uh, I'd like to, to uh, say three uh, points here. The, the first point is that there are uh, countries uh, like Singapore who are successful in their upskilling program. They have the Skills Future and uh, the uh, AS Skills Future program. It provides comprehensive mapping of resources on education, career, and training. Uh, and so a clerk who probably wanted to become a computer programmer will be guided by it has it, it will show the pathways it will show the skills required and the good thing about this is that the government is all there there are subsidies to all singaporeans so that they can pursue uh, skills and reskilling and upskilling uh, and even pursuing lifelong learning another uh, uh, important feature of this one is that uh, the firms are mandated to uh, set aside some funds for the workers, uh, work for their workers' uh, uh, skills mastery and pursuit of lifelong learning. So the per first point is that we can learn uh, from the Singaporean experience in terms of uh, in terms of uh, best practices, in terms of uh, their experiences, what are the needed, what are the uh, resources needed, who are the actors, uh, what will it take in order to set up this kind of, of uh, program, and what will it take to maintain it? Uh, that that's the first one. The second is that uh, as we think about the, of, about this national upskilling program, we need to leverage uh, digital platforms to develop uh, skills and training systems uh, in order to. Uh, bring together uh, public and private uh, sector. So this has to be a whole of society approach. Uh, it has to be a collaboration uh, between, among rather, among uh, government, academe, industry, workers association, and training uh, providers, um, uh, private and public. So it ensures the, the continuity of the skill system when there's collaboration. It strengthens the sharing of information, tools, and resources as the system evolves. Um, collaboration here is key uh, because it allows the collection and analysis of data to improve the provision of services. That's one. Second is the identification of additional programs in order for us to respond to the evolving needs of the local and global uh, labor markets. The third one is that it, it uh, collaboration also allows forging new develop, uh, new collaborations with other other actors, like for example, industry practitioners becoming tra training providers as well. And then the fourth one is that it, it also allows the development of uh, financing strategies uh, uh, in order to, to uh, put the financing strategies uh, for the uh, of the uh, workers skills needs. So the third point is that um, there are already existing government programs and initiatives uh, to set up the skills and training systems. And, and I'm just going to mention, I'm sure there are other uh, uh, government programs and initiatives, but I'm only going to mention uh, three. Um, the, D the DICT's digital jobs PH program, that's one. Uh, it conducts training to equip Filipinos with ICT related skills to assist economically disadvantaged areas, especially in the countryside and rural communities. Uh, and the second one is we have the qualifications framework. So this qualifications framework or uh, uh, PQF, Philippine uh, Qualifications Framework, it describes the level of educational qualifications and sets the standard for qualification outcomes. And then the third one, we have the Philippine Talent Map Initiative by the Dole, it determines the strength and weaknesses of the current workforce uh, and it, uh, to, in order uh, to address job skills mismatch through a competency-based assessment. So in terms of, of building blocks, there we already have uh, these building blocks, uh, but we only have, for example, to probably come together the, for this thing, to, these to come together coupled with understanding of the experiences and best practices of the Singapore of the Singapore's uh, skills future. Then probably we can come up with a good national upskilling program. Um, uh, next uh, slide, please. So key message number three, there is a need to design a social protection system that covers all types of work uh, arrangement. And as I have uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the one, one issue here is that uh, workers are con considered uh, contractors or self-employed, and therefore they do not have security benefits and protection entitlements. Uh, next slide, please. So. 
um, there are certain segments of the population that are more likely to be drawn to online work. One is uh, young people and the other and the other group is women. Young people, uh, they are more likely to be drawn to this kind of work because they are technologically savvy people. They uh, know the internet, they, they know online tools and resources. Uh, and they uh, belong to the to a network of so equally social equally um, uh, technologically savvy people as uh, equally savvy people, and therefore they are more likely to be drawn to this online work. Now uh, there are issues in terms uh, of this age composition of platform workers because it can result in the uh, in the erosion of contribution base of uh, of the social protection schemes. Uh, it therefore it can result in increasing coverage gaps. Uh, weakening of the sustainability of social protection schemes and, and issues on financing future entitlements because as more and more people are, are going into this online work then um, and, and the, they, they don't contribute to any sort of social protection scheme. So the, there might be some issues in terms of future entitlement, uh, financing uh, uh, future entitlements, increasing coverage gap, and this can result in the straining of public finance because of social assistance to the unemployed and in between jobs. Um, more importantly, it can also uh, result in the crowding, crowding out of other government programs, especially in the time of uh, the crisis. Uh, women are also more likely to be drawn to online work precisely because of the idea of flexibility. Um, so this gender composition of platform workers can exacerbate gendered inequalities. We know that here here in the Philippines, social protection is tied to formal employment. And 50% uh, of women are not in the labor force. And those who end up working, 50% are on account. So more likely not covered by any social protection scheme. Uh, next slide, please. So there are suggestions from various fronts. One would be the decoupling of social protection from employment, but there are issues here. Uh, one is that some workers may not be able to accumulate sufficient entitlements due to, to their work uh, and income patterns, and therefore um, inadequate coverage. It can result in inadequate coverage and benefits. Uh, second is that if we do that, if we decouple social protection from uh, employment, we can we will be giving too much role to private entities, and we might end up not providing any protection to the uh, to the people who who we wanted to have protection to begin with. Um, uh, lastly, it can also result in the weakening of the employer's responsibility towards their workers, which is something that the decent work is uh, preventing. Uh, and then a suggestion as well regarding the universal basic income. Uh, issues here would be the benefit levels may not be enough to cover a standard, uh, uh, standard of, uh, decent standard of living. Uh, the more, more importantly would be the crowding out of uh, the financing of other public services. So if, if we, before we can even begin to think of uh, implementing this, there has to be a nuanced analysis. Uh, having said that, um, next slide please. Having said that, we uh, were able to compile some desirables or desirable uh, features of a social protection system. Uh, there are four uh, uh, features here, universal uh, and equal, uh, and equal uh, access and flexibility. Uh, flex flexibly designed. Um, so this means that there has to be a flexible eligibility definition, one that covers work in any work arrangements and can be uh, customized to accommodate the needs and preferences of workers. The second it ha is it has to be portable, agile, and transferable. Uh, it should recognize the idea that workers can move in, in and out of certain types of work uh, in response to local and global labor markets. The third one would be uh, um, it, it the, this social protection system need to be integrated, needs to be integrated with allied services and programs. So for example, we were, so for uh, example, unemployment insurance, that is going to be a social protection. But this unemployment insurance should not only provide uh, uh, minimum income while the person is unemployed, but it should also cover reskilling and upskilling training costs to facilitate movement in between in between jobs. So there has to be um, a link of social protection and skills development systems. And lastly, um, uh, social protection system needs to be facilitated by technology, meaning leveraging technology to facilitate enrollment, payment of uh, contribution, uh, payment of benefits, and even providing uh, nudges uh, uh, like 
texting uh, people to provide nudges uh, so that they will be encouraged more uh, in in uh, in uh, contributing to the the to the social protection scheme. And uh, next slide, please. Okay, key message number four, um, Asian nations can explore the platform economy as an area of cooperation. And we've already said that there are some problems for, uh, for, uh, that are uh, encountered by Asian uh, workers. Uh, they have lower wages for Asian workers and there are rejection of outputs. Uh, there's also the lack of grievance mechanisms or mechanisms for dispute resolution. Um, so in a standard work arrangement, it's a lot, it's very easy for workers to organize labor groups into labor groups. Labor groups, they're very important uh, because these provide a voice for uh, advocacy and negotiation. Now, in terms of platform uh, workers or online workers, they are geographically, geographically dispersed and anonymous uh, pool of platform workers who are likely to, to view each other as competitors. And therefore, mounting a call to action or even organizing a labor rights group can be really a challenge. And so um, there has to be a way for the, uh, these issues to be collectively addressed, uh, to collectively address critical issues. So, so uh, uh, Asian nations can, can come together so that um, they can influence the narrative from competition to collaboration and to influence unfavorable practices such as underbidding and race to the bottom uh, mentality. Uh, key message uh, number five, next slide please. Key message number five, the last uh, message is that there is a need to improve the visibility of platform work to fill in critical knowledge gaps. Uh, and this, uh, this, visi this visibility is key uh, in terms, uh, sorry, uh, key to visibility is data, which we currently do not have. And therefore we need to define platform work. We need to classify the range of economic activities in platform work. The absence of, of definition and uh, the absence of classification contributes to challenges in data collection and measurement. There is a need for us to have um, uh, definition, classification, and then we need to have a methodology in order to collect data. We need to collect data and then we can measure and we can analyze. Now we can include a module of platform work as a rider to the LFS, but um, doing that may not be adequate to capture the scope and complexity of, of existing work arrangements in the platform. And then last two things here that I'd like to say is that uh, tracking down, uh, there are challenges in terms of collecting data. One is tracking down platform workers uh, would be very, would be a challenge. Second is that enticing them to participate and truthfully disclose information uh, would would also be a challenge, especially on the heels of potential taxation of the online economy. I think that is the last slide. Yeah, that is the last slide. Thank you very much for listening. We greatly appreciate your thought-provoking uh, presentation, uh, Connie. Thank you very much uh, for enlightening us on the issues um, confronting platform workers, particularly those involved in crowd work, and how these uh, issues impinge on decent work and on the sustainability of this employment arrangement. Uh, friends, let us now move to the next presentation, um, which which was called from a research paper written by uh, Dr. Francis Kimba, Ms. Maureen uh, Rosellion, and Ms. Silwin Calizo. Uh, to present the paper is um, Dr. Uh, Francis Kimba, another uh, senior research fellow at PIBS. He's also the director of the Philippine Apex Study Center Network, and his research areas include trade and industrial development, innovation, and rural development. And at present, he is interested in studying the innovation activity of local firms. Uh, Francis obtained his master's degree in international development from the International University of Japan and his second master's degree and PhD in development economics from the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Tokyo, Japan. The floor is now yours, Dr. Kimba. Thank you, Sheila. Am I coming in loud and clear? Yes. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this webinar. Uh, this presentation draws heavily from the, uh, as, I, as uh, Dr. Shar has mentioned, the, the work that we did on the digital divide, and it is a uh, work that I, I did with uh, Mr. Silwin Calizo and uh, Maureen Rosellion. So in the next slide, let me first present 
uh, a framework to help us understand the relationship between the digital divide and the digital platform. And I present here the framework of Van Dyke, which I also tweak a little bit. So looking at the technology landscape, we seem to be in between the development of ICT and the next innovation, which may be manifesting itself as digital platforms. As such, we perceive digital divide that is caused by and related to the current state of technology or, the I, or ICT. But we are also starting to perceive some of the new manifestations of what I call a platform divide. Van Dyke distinguishes four kinds of barriers to access corresponding e to each of the four types of access. Motivational or mental access divide is driven by the lack of elementary digital experience, technology anxiety, and the unattractiveness or unfriendliness of new technology. Other factors that may contribute to motivational or mental access divide include low levels of income, low levels of education, and even the lack of time, as Gobadi in 2013 uh, mentioned. The second type of barrier includes those that limit physical access to a computer, a mobile phone, or even to a network connection. This would include the cost of internet subscriptions and mobile phone accounts. Similar and similar to the mental access divide, low levels of income, low levels of education, and absence of even absence of occupation may contribute to this barrier. Skills access divide is divided into three types. The first is the operational skills or the capacity to work with hardware and software. The second is informational skills, which are, are include the skills to search, select, and process information in the computer and the network sources. And third is the strategic skills, which includes capacities to use computer and network sources as the means for a particular goal, such as earning a living or uh, in, ge in general, improving your position in society. Skills access is limited by the insufficient digital skills caused by lack of user friendliness of the technology, inadequate education, or social support. Gobadi 2013 points out that really education is the foundation critical of critically affecting all three types of skills. Usage access is the differential use of ICT applications in everyday, in everyday life, and this could include both the actual use of the ICT as well as the active versus passive use of ICT. Active and, or creative use of ICT is about the contributions to the internet, for instance, publishing a personal website, creating a web blog, posting a contribution on an online bulletin board, news group, or community, while passive would just include absorbing information. Usage is, la is largely linked to demographic characteristics of users and technical connections, such as your, your social class, your education, your age, gender, and even the effectiveness of your network connections. So Van Dyke's model suggests that when the full process of technology appropriation is completed, a new innovation comes up and the entire process again repeats. So usage access enables people to maximize the use of the current technology, and in this case, ICT, which may lead to the development and use of new innovations and then usage opportunities become more enhanced in the discovery and the use of more complex applications and innovations and this would include the platform economy so guiding now guiding us now here this framework let me just present um some barriers some some examples of the for instance uh, motivational access which refers to to the in the next slide, um, motivational access refers to the desire to have a computer or a mobile phone and be connected to the internet. And this desire is affected by social, cultural, or psychological factors. One of the main barriers for accessing the internet would be not knowing what it is and what it can do. And in a survey conducted by Wu et al. in 2016, in 11 countries from 2014 to 2015, it was found that over two-thirds of those currently offline did not know what the internet is. And for instance, only 13, 11, and 5% knew what the internet is in Thailand, Indonesia, and India, respectively. So in the next slide, let's talk about the Philippine case. Those who are aware of the importance of the internet and perceive that it is important would have already hurdled a significant barrier to internet use. For the case of the Philippines, motivational barriers to internet use include awareness, interest and trust, and security issues. This is revealed by the results of the ICT survey conducted by the DICT. 
while the most common barriers would be related to cost and availability, there is still a considerable number of people who mentioned first not knowing about the internet, 11.4%, um, perception that there would be no useful or interesting content on the internet, 12.7%, and security issues, 3.77%, as barriers to their use of the internet. So now let us look at the other indicators um, of digital divide in Asia to see certain patterns of the population having better access to computers and the internet. Data from the ITU statistics database in the next slide, and then another slide. All right, uh, could you move back one slide, please? So data from the ITU statistics database or more recent data is available for 2019 shows that the developed countries outperform the developing countries and LDCs in a number of ICT access indicators such as mobile, that mobile phone, internet use, and broadband subscriptions. This pattern of more affluent areas having better access is also reflected within countries. The upper left-hand figure shows that the computer ownership in Singapore is higher for those living in private housing than those who live in public housing. Only about 86% of those living in public housing own computers, while the proportion is 97% for those who live in private housing. As private housing in Singapore is dominated by higher income Singapore citizens, expatriates, private investors, this discrepancy in access may be an indication of the role of income as a determinant in computer ownership and internet access. The case of Sri Lanka looks at the skills in computer and digital technology. Computer literacy and digital literacy is significantly higher for those living in urban areas. For 2018, 40.4% of those living in urban areas is considered computer literate, while for those living in rural areas, the proportion is only 27%. Much lower than this would be those living in estate areas, in which only 10.8% is digitally literate. This is consistent with the case of Singapore, which relates richer or more affluent areas to better internet access. So in the next slide, we see that data for a number of countries also show All right. Data for Singapore shows that 96% of those who are 15 to 34 per, who are aged 15 to 34 in 2018 have individual computer usage. And in contrast, the proportion is only 33% for those who are 60 years old and above. So this is an indication that there's better digital access for those who are not so old and not so young. So there's essentially in the middle. For South Korea, the pattern for mobile internet usage is almost similar, although the peak is much wider. So it's around 20 to 49 years old. Also, those 60 to 69 years old still has a much higher mobile internet use, but the statistic is significantly lower for 70 years old and above. The discrepancy in access by age groups is not only for material access, but also in terms of skills, as exemplified by the case of Sri Lanka. Those who are computer or digital literate is highest among 15 to 19 and 20 to 24 years old. The younger age groups are from 5 years old to 14 years old, and the older age groups from about 50 years old to 70 years old have smaller proportions and following very similar patterns to Singapore and Korea. Similarly, the pattern is, uh, very fo is followed very closely by China. Internet users are mostly around 20 to, 13, 20 to 29 years old or 30 to 39 years old. The age group with the lowest proportion would be those below 10 years old and those above 60 years old. And then in terms of gender, we find that ICT access is commonly better for males than females. Data for a number of countries also show that ICT access is commonly better for males than females. The data on internet users for India and China show that internet users are mostly male. And not only ICT access is higher for males, data for Sri Lanka also shows that females have lower computer and digital literacy than males. But for the Philippines, this is an, is, is not the same. The Philippine case is actually the females that have better access to the internet. In terms of skills divide, data for the Philippines shows 
that the more highly skilled segments of the population, the college, the high school, and those who are um, vocational, um, have education, but vocational, tend to use the computers for more productive or advanced tasks. Interestingly, the least advanced tasks, such as entertainment and gaming related activities, would have high participation of both skilled and unskilled segments. But while the task involving data management and analysis, modeling and simulation, would involve only those that are highly skilled segments of the population. So these segments, uh, in the next slide, let me just try to sum things up. So these segments are also the ones that are more likely to benefit in the platform economy. So what are these segments? Those that are living in affluent areas, those who are aware, uh, could you move back? Those who are aware of, um, more aware of the internet and perceive its usefulness, those who are not too young or not too old, and those who are male. These are the ones who are more likely to benefit from the platform economy, mainly because of the, the they are able to um, surpass the barriers of access, all uh, four types of barriers. So now let's look at um, examples. So the, and these segments are most more likely to benefit from the platform economy. So let's look at the next slide. So looking at the motivational barriers to trust, we look at the relationship of e-commerce and corruption. Corruption tends to breed distrust in the policy environment, and such distrust may affect the use of the digital technology to undertake e-commerce transactions. The platform economy is largely associated with digital transactions in e-commerce. And we find here that the figure shows that the countries associated with low incidence of corruption, for instance, Singapore, Japan, Switzerland, Israel, these are associated with higher rank in the e-commerce index, so more likely to have um, e-commerce transactions. In the next slide, we show that the participation in digital platforms, again, is more common to the not so young or not so old, similar to the what we have seen in terms of access to ICT. And this can and this pattern can be seen in, in a number of countries like China, Japan, India, Canada, Philippines, and even Taiwan. What is interesting would be for the Philippines, well, online shoppers are highest for around the 18 to 24 years old. There are on, these are only the second largest online shopping group. It's actually the 25 to 34 years old that uh, per, is the highest. The, per, and this is perhaps because that this is the group that is earning more relative to the 18 to 24 years old. Another interesting case would be the case of Japan, which shows that there are platform activities in which the younger generations participate in, such as the video sharing and uploading. Of, and But these are activities that really don't cost any money. These are activities that would involve uh, less monetary transactions. The activities that would involve monetary transactions would be higher among those that are already working. Again, an indication that maybe income is a, is a determinant of the use of digital platforms. As shown in the earlier figures, those who are more educated also tend to use computers for more advanced tasks. And uh, again, exemplifying uh, in the next slide, we want to show that the digital skills are important to maximize the use of the digital economy. So more technological skills is positively associated with the use of advanced with advanced tasks undertaken by firms. There is a positive correlation of having digital technological skills of the economy with the use of big data and analytics and the digital transformation of, of companies. And this is important for countries to support the adoption of firms of the digital technology and participation in the platform economy. So in the next slide, we, are, we just want to show that we, if we are going to look at digital transactions, which again is a foundation for the participation in the platform economy, we find discrepancies among different um, uh, sectors. So for example, in Japan, we see the comparison between men and women, we see a comparison between those who are in labor and out of the labor force. And for China, we see a comparison here of between uh, educational attainment and see that, um, again, very specific um, segments have a better part participation or access to uh, the digital transactions. Furthermore, we see that often males tend to participate more because males tend to have better access to ICT and uh, other um, issues related to access. 
this is translated to un some unequal patterns of access to digital platforms that uh, can be seen when you compare uh, the access of males and females. This is evident in the use of the online shopping platform, for example, in Netherlands and um, e-commerce in China. So not only in terms of e-commerce and online shopping, uh, uh, could you move to the next slide, please? All right, so we, what we want to see here is that of, if we look at the middle uh, figure, we see that for South Korea, um, ride hailing services is relatively unequal for the less popular mobile apps in South Korea. While females typically use the two most popular apps, the males actually have better or more choices. They're the ones who are using also the less popular apps, maybe because this is an issue of security, issue of a better access, and a better of um, more trust in the other uh, apps. Again, putting the females in uh, a disadvantageous uh, position. All right, so in the next slide, let us talk about other um, issues. So we're looking at uh, digital transactions, but let us see about the case of e-learning. So what we have here is we looked at the uh, TESDA online program or the top. So the map shows that 16.5% of the TESDA online program registered users are residing in low HDI areas and 2.69% of the users are in severely poor communities. The location of the 4,018 users that we were able to survey were overlaid with a map of the Human Development Index performance for each province in the country. And it shows that the correlation of users is higher in areas in which are relatively richer or more developed. Data also shows that the better skilled have better access. Usually the college undergraduates or the college graduates would register to the TESDA online program. Looking for at the case for other countries, we have found that the same patterns are, exist in terms of age. It is indeed those who are 18 to 44, again, the not so young and not so old, who are accessing e-learning in Vietnam. We also see similar patterns for um, in terms of age, but um, I, I didn't uh, show it here anymore. How about uh, digital health, mHealth, mobile health? Mobile health is defined as the use of mobile services, such as mobile phones, um, uh, patient monitoring devices, personal digital assistance, and wireless devices for medical and public health practice. Examples of mHealth applications provided in the survey conducted in 2015 by the GOE um, covered a broad spectrum of telephone helplines, text message appointment reminders, to mobile telehealth and mobile access to electronic patient information. So mHealth, Global Diffusion of eHealth, can contribute to achieving um, universal health care services and through making services available to remote populations and underserved communities and providing mechanisms for data exchange on patients and services. And it can be used to increase access to provision of health services in areas where there is little infrastructure to support internet or traditional health services. So what we find here is that, uh, could you move to the next slide I'm on mobile health? All right, so for mobile health, high income countries have more mobile health programs than low income countries. And this would include services such as providing information, collecting healthcare information, and providing health services. Again, we, we find here is that the more affluent areas tend to participate more in the digital economy and not just in the digital and the financial transactions, but also in terms of he, uh, education and health. So in the next slide, what I want to also emphasize is that platforms are also facing their own issues related to usage divide. And that is what the model of Van Dyke has already, is already saying. So in the next slide, let me just um, try to show you who, what, who would er, probably earn more from Airbnb or the accommodation platforms. We can observe there that there's a concentration of Airbnb postings in the central districts and in the busy areas in Seoul and Singapore. And the same can be observed for Sri Lanka. Areas in the periphery, while having some Airbnb postings, do not enjoy the scale that is observed in the central districts. And it seems that there's a divide from those who have assets that have access to central districts and those that have assets that are from nearby districts and those that are um, far away from the, the tourist spots or the, the areas of interest. Second, what we also see is that crowd workers tend to be well-educated. Within crowd platforms, there is an indication that the well-educated 
tend to participate more. It's actually found here in an earlier study by the ILO. Next, we what we also find as another uh, indication of some platform divide is that um, usage divide could be seen in how Americans earn from digital platforms. Uh, a study by J.P. Morgan Chase shows that those who are able to earn more from digital platforms are those who have assets which can be rented out to earn supplemental income. And this is in contrast to people who work in labor platforms, which do so in order to offset their monthly earnings. Next, let me, let's just look at them, uh, a special type of user. So there are types of users in the next slide. Uh, I want to show uh, uh, indirect users of digital platforms. Cuts International in 2018 conducted a study on digital platforms in India. And based on their survey, 48% of respondents were aware that digital platforms can be used to transfer money to others. 37% are aware that can be used to make utility and tax payments, and 39% are aware that can be used to purchase goods and services. However, of those who are aware that the use of, of the uses of digital payments, only 25% actually make use of it, while some of those who do not use it, 13% actually use digital payments with the help of others. So these are what we call indirect users. And this reflects the limited capacity and trust of some consumers on using digital payment services themselves, which shows that digital platforms may face a motivational access barrier. So let me just summarize three key takeaways in the next slide. Digital divide can be seen as a determinant of the use of digital platforms as barriers to material access, motivational and skills access affect how digital platforms will be used and maximized. Platforms also face their own issues related to the usage divide, which may contribute to higher levels of inequality. And so policy interventions should address not only the provision of material access, but also addressing other forms of divide. And in the next two slides, I, let me just try to provide some policy recommendations. So in the next slide, we, I provide here some policy recommendations um, addressing three different the three different types of access, motivational, materials, and skills. Countries in the region have been tracking the performance of digital usage in terms of material access to the internet, computers, and mobile phone, but there is limited information in terms of participation in the digital platforms and the other factors necessary to participate in these. There should be moves to increase trust in the use of digital platforms. And together with this, there should be programs to increase the capability of consumers to make use of digital platforms in everyday life. And businesses should have the opportunity and capability to make use of digital platforms to expand their markets and meet the demands of consumers. The experience of many countries and even the Philippines with the use of digital technology in the COVID-19 pandemic shows that while internet access and having a mobile phone is necessary condition, to participate in the platform economy, it's not sufficient. Other factors are also equally important and need to be addressed. Finally, let because of the special cases that I have shown, example for e-commerce and M health, mobile health, and e-learning, let me just provide some policy recommendations addressing um, issues for each. So for example, for e-commerce, we want to reduce the regulatory burden for businesses and obtain the trust of consumers by handholding on the use of the platforms and increasing data security to address the concerns of those who are afraid of, um, of taking the risk of using uh, digital platforms and digital payments. For, for e-health or m-health, improving policy environments surrounding e-health, which would include the use of digital appointments, digital data collection, and e-prescriptions, there is a need to increase awareness from both doctors and consumers on telemedicine. And finally, for e-learning, we want to provide a less expensive me means of participating in e-learning and also to involve both the public and the private sector in the important formulation of modules, as this can also uh, provide uh, better opportunities and um, more uh, options for participating in e-learning. So I think this is my last slide, and I thank you all for um, the opportunity again to present. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Francis. Uh, your presentation shows uh, who benefits and who loses uh, from the digital economy, which is a critical information in crafting uh, interventions for the marginalized sectors. Now, friends, having listened to uh, two presenters, uh, discuss the challenges affecting uh, the participation in, in the di digital economy. Let us hear what our 
discussants have to say about the study's findings and recommendations, as well as their from the perspective of the uh, sector where they belong. So our first discussion, our first discussant is Dr. Uh, Kevin Chua, who is a senior economist at the Macroeconomics, Trade and Investment Global Practice in the Philippine Office of the World Bank. He leads the preparation of the biannual uh, Philippines Economic Update and the bank's advisory and development policy lending support to the Philippines. Um, he has co-led the East Asia and Pacific Economic Update and the Thailand Economic Monitor and the and he's also the lead author of the Philippines Digital Economy Report. Uh, prior to joining the bank, he was an assistant professor of economics at the Shandong University Center for Economic Research in China, a consultant for the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs in New York, and credit officer in a local commercial bank in the Philippines. Uh, Dr. Chu was a PhD in economics from Fordham University and a master's degree um, in international affairs from Columbia University. Dr. Chua, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Sheila. Can you hear me? Can you hear me yes, well? Yes, very well. Thank okay. you. I want to extend my gratitude to PITS for giving me this opportunity to provide feedback reaction to the two presentations. The topics themselves on online work, decent jobs, social protection, and the digital divide are very timely and relevant considering the accelerated pace of digitalization in the Philippines amid the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Digitalization is heralded as a game changer that can lead to significant development opportunities, but not without risk. The digital transformation process itself echoes the Schumpeter notion of creative destruction, ushering in new and more efficient processes and ways of doing things, but leading to the destruction of old irrelevant ones. As these two papers show, there will be winners and there will be losers. The rising tide will not lift all boats. We therefore have to recognize and address the challenges and risks. And as a first step, and a, and a first step is to understand the issues, the state of the digital and platform divide, the shifting pattern of labor demand and supply for online work, the general trend and regional disparity of platform acceptance and usage, among others. I congratulate the authors for contributing to a better understanding of these issues. Let me proceed to the first presentation towards a sustainable platform work. This paper provides an overview of the silex pattern of online work in the Philippines and compares indicators across countries in ASEAN. It neatly lays out the demand and supply side of the labor market for platform work and reveals some key results, such as one, most demand for online work originates from advanced economies, the U.S. the major contributor. And two, developing, developing economies constitute most of supply, with the Philippines among the top suppliers of online work. The growth prospect of online work in Asia is huge, and the Philippines stand to benefit from it in terms of employment opportunities, opportunities for decent work, gender equality, and for poverty eradication. But there are challenges including on vulnerability of contractual workers, the potential for abusive online work practices, weaknesses in social protection, and the ensuing sustainability of social protection schemes. The paper wrapped up with policy recommendations aimed at addressing these issues so that Filipinos can take advantage of online opportunities. I have three key points to raise. First, it's a clear need for the Philippines to move up the online work value chain. As the study shows, a large portion of online workers in the Philippines are working in jobs that have low value added. The situation is made more precarious by the global, global oversupply of online labor, which is exerting downward pressure in compensation and weakening workers' power. Competition is tough as Filipino workers compete with, with each other and compete with others in the region. It thus makes business sense to capacitate and upskill workers so they rise up. This will help protect employment because there is less competition in jobs with high skill requirement and wages are more commensurate with higher value added. Rising up the value chain will also be beneficial to employers because it will insulate them from the race to the bottom competition among jobs. How specifically the Philippines can move up the online work value chain 
would be an excellent topic for another research. However, the paper gave early hints at where to potentially look at. The country appears to have a comparative advantage on the creative and multimedia industry, which covers areas like audiovisual, animation, advertisement, game development, the good news is that the uh, support development of the affiliated industry, aligning it with its inclusive innovation industrial strategy, and launching and even launching the creative economy roadmap. Another to look at is software development and technology, where 40% of online workers in the Philippines are engaged with. There is a to support expansion, considering that based on another study, there is a projected oversupply of IT graduates in the Philippines by 2025. Second, we need to focus on setting up the building blocks. Instead of focusing on specific skills, I agree with the report, report recommendation that a better approach would be on the creation of a sustainable ecosystem, encompassing skill development program, and training support initiatives that are useful in any type of work settings. The reason lies in the rapidly evolving nature of technology coupled with our insufficient understanding of it. What may be relevant in the now may not well be the same in the future. For example, years ago, medical transcription was thought to be the next big wave in BTO, but it hasn't taken off the way we thought it to be. Call center work attractive and competitive, with the growth outlook still very much positive. However, there are emerging threats like automation, new technologies, chatbots, customer service applications, and AI that can troubleshoot and build customer relationship without having a person involved. I have some conversations with a few industry players in the BPO industry. One interesting feedback I learned is that 20 years ago, that was around 2000, the ability to communicate with English is considered already active. Nowadays, that is no longer the case. It's considered the ability to data science, data analytics, software development, product management. With the uncertainty that the future holds, the better approach, therefore, is to set up the ecosystem and the building blocks. It means good infrastructure, like the availability of fast, reliable, and affordable internet, human capital development strategies. We should have flexible and updated curriculum, adequate training centers and trainers. We also need a functioning information and knowledge sharing platform and mechanism business support and financing facilities for firms so that when opportunities arrive, employers and employees can react with agility. Third, we need to promote social protection for workers in the online work sector. As most online workers are classified as contractual workers, they do not enjoy security benefits and protection entitlements, which makes them very vulnerable to shocks on income and health. Likewise, as more individuals engage in platform work, they are excluded to pension and social, social security fund contributions that can ultimately undermine the sustainability of this program. It thus seems clear that it would be beneficial to draw this work to ensure health and safety coverage and protect the sustainability of pension programs. But to what specific form for a social protection program is very difficult to answer. The suggestion of the report is very well taken and a good start. That is, to build social protection programs for online workers based on some desirable characteristics. Chief of them uh, is that the scheme should be portable, agile, and transferable. That means social protection plus the work and not the work. For future studies, I suggest give more flesh on the social protection scheme for online workers. This is a huge topic deserving of a separate paper. Now let me now proceed to the second presentation. Understanding the divide implications from developing Asia. The study is important precisely because it flags the risk of inequality arising from the digital divide and the usage divide with platform. It followed Van Dyke's community and recursive model as a conceptual framework to understand the source of the digital divide. Looking at measures that captures the various aspects, educational, material, skills, and usage. It then provides an overview of the fault lines, income levels, age gender, education, and geographical location, and conducts comparative analysis across countries in developing Asia. The study cops in policy with some policy recommendations. Similarly, I would like to raise three points, and I would like to frame these points relative to the Philippines experience. First, internet 
penetration in the Philippines stands at 67%, which translates to 74 million Filipino internet users. This number is from the size of the population in the country. This is an indication that perhaps motivational access is a significant problem. But what would be a key hurdle is material access. The availability and affordability of reliable internet remains a challenge. Digital infrastructure is limited to remote and rural areas, and where they are available, the internet services are relatively expensive and of poor quality. This contributed to the digital divide, which leads to unequal to services delivered by the internet. For, in for instance, work from home arrangement will not benefit workers who are not equipped with, re with reliable internet connections at home. Similarly, Distance learning and online classes will leave children in poorer households falling further behind due to the lack of internet devices. Second, most Filipinos use internet for basic communication, entertainment, and gaming, and not for more advanced productive purposes. These are loss of for personal development tied to this level of the computer importance of technology in the society, digital literacy is becoming one of the most valuable tools for lifelong learning. At the basic, digital literacy has to cover rudimentary ICT skills and internet know-how to provide individuals the attitude to access online services and use digital content. The Philippines is on the right direction by incorporating ICT in the enhanced K-12 curriculum. However, more can be done. In Singapore, for example, the skills Future program promotes lifelong learning, especially for adults who are offered tailored programs on what we're learning as priority skills, including data analytics, technology and digital media, and cyber security. Third point: digital innovations can lead to economy-wide economy-wide productivity gains only when they are widely accepted and adopted. To gain the wider acceptance and usage of platforms. Trust will be crucial. Addressing the trust issue will be easier if people are digitally literate. It is the extent of technology, the benefits, and the risk. However, beyond digital literacy, the government must ensure that users, within households or firms, are protected from abuse and misuse from, from malicious people. Setting up a consumer protection framework and strong cybersecurity with a strong and effective grievance mechanism will be very important. But there may be another important angle to look at, and that is to protect people and their lives from the new technology. Here in 2019, tremendous pushback and backlash on the use of ride-sharing application. After multiple incidences of suicides by elderly drivers, the elderly drivers were afraid that the app would exacerbate the meager standard of labor. This South Korean experience shows that the key to the wider adoption of a new technology may not just be the advanced network and speed internet, internet, but a better social protection system. Without a caution for those left behind by technological progress, it is harder to marshal support and trust to this technology. And with this final report, uh, with, the, with this final comment, I circle back to the first presentation, highlighting the need to look into social protection systems. Thank you very much. I end my uh, discussion. Thank you. And thank you to uh, Dr. Shugo for your uh, insightful comments. Now uh, let us move to our um, second uh, discussion. Our second discussion is from the Department of Information and Communications Technology or the ICT. He is officer in charge, director three of the ICT's National Planning and Corporate Management Bureau and the former head of the department's National ICT Planning Division, responsible for the formulation of various national ICT plans. He was also the former Deputy, uh, Deputy Program Manager of the ICT's TV White Space Technology Study Program and was one of the country's national ICT expert to the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Our discussion is more than 20 years of professional work experience in ICT and cybersecurity this and has extensive knowledge in public telecommunications and cybersecurity project planning, implementation, and operation. The floor is now yours, Director Tardio. Okay, uh, thank you, Sheila. Uh, can I check? Can you hear me clearly? Yes, very clear, sir. 
Okay, thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate the PIDS and uh, having these documents. And uh, allow me also to congratulate uh, the past uh, three speakers in the, uh, sharing their uh, uh, valuable uh, presentations and insights uh, for these uh, uh, activities. Um, okay. Actually, uh, would like to 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 uh, acknowledge, and we would like to emphasize the findings on the on the papers that uh, we do uh, agree that the digital divides now we have you, you call this the cumulative and recursive model for that device. And uh, if, if you recall, uh, the government's focus before is uh, if you if you if you have some uh, remember the Department of uh, the Transportation and Communications uh, before we have this telecommunications office. The the very focus there is the to serve the unserved and the underserved. Now, it now becomes to this uh, particular um, uh, digital divide, motivational, material, skills, and usage. And with that, I'd like to, uh, uh, to, to, to say that this, uh, this is very, very timely, and uh, this is what, what we need as the, 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 because of the technology trends. And uh, for the, for the um, your recommendations will be uh, taken very, very seriously and the uh, uh, in the work of, with the DICT is uh, mandated. So meanwhile, the discussions, a paper on online work and, and uh, the Philippines has clearly conveyed with that uh, the pandemic at hand has received the way we work by rapidly accelerating the use of digital technologies that enable individual to engage in telecommuting, work from home and virtual collaboration schemes. However, the pandemic has also made evident that pressing issues related to this work scheme, such as the social protection for platform or online workers, such as security benefits and protection entitlements and sustainability if the social protection mechanisms are in place, among others. Furthermore, it has also been identified the need of upscaling uh, and uh, the scaling of online platform workers in the lower end of the value chain, such as the creative, multimedia, and sales marketing support, who have been greatly affected by the pandemic. With this provided information and understanding, the government may be able to develop and implement initiatives and implement mechanisms which will support the scaling and upscaling of online workers in the institutionalization of social protection mechanisms which can be kickstarted by mapping online platform work providers and uh, workers. The discussion paper, on the, however, on the digital divide in the platform economy has identified factors which further extends the digital divide, which include the lack of prior digital experience or education, lack of trust or negative perception on the internet, low income level and cost of internet subs subscriptions and uh, devices. Likewise, an availability and accessibility, uh, accessibility operational information and strategic skills has contributed to digital divide. Demographic characteristics such as the social class, education, age, gender, and uh, it is a uh, ethnicity and the quality of digital infrastructure also greatly influence the varying levels of uh, the utilization. The growing uh, digital divide among Filipinos may be addressed through efforts in improving the statistical systems by including indicators that will measure access and participation in digital platforms, addressing issues related to digital platform access, such as cost of device, and subscription as well. The quality of the digital infrastructure, the retooling of scaling in digital platforms uses. This is very, very important. The government may also infuse gender and development, or what we call the God in developing various initiatives in terms of digital platform to be able to consider gender needs 
and be able to more effectively respond to their specific digital demands. Meaningful access to ICT shall also be promoted more aggressively for the disadvantaged segments of the society, such as the persons with disability, poor in those people living in the country's right for them to be able to keep up with the educational and other socially valuable contents available online. The government must also advance efforts to create an environment that favors digitalization, innovation, and startup support to provide more opportunities to wider array of beneficiaries. With this, I would like to share to you some of the DICT's plans and programs for this uh, purpose. Uh, related as well to the social uh, protections for online uh, platform uh, work, the department was able to develop and implement initiatives that will support the reskilling, upscaling of workers such as the digital workforce, scaled up scaling for IT BPM workers, digital jobs, PH, and ICT development in the countryside. Before I forgot to mention all of these activities for this ICT capacity building is being uh, uh, collaborated, for example, with our TESDA. Uh, yours truly is uh, the, the department representative in crafting some regulations on the um, uh, training just to respond to this current situation, like in the incident response and so on. Delivered through either face-to-face, -face, virtual, or hybrid blended models. These initiatives were able to produce train rescaled, upscaled individuals from various sectors and will continually implement this as department support not only on the country's campaign to increase global competitiveness, but also to contribute on the government post-pandemic recovery efforts. The DICT also is currently implementing the following ICT programs such as the National Broadband Plan. And uh, we're currently updating this, uh, what we call the Digital Infrastructure Plan, which aims to ensure that all Filipinos have access to broadband capa uh, cap capability through government investment in broadband infrastructures. Why do the, we do support the public-private partnership in this, but uh, you know, the, the government through the DICT has this very strong uh, plans and programs to reach, whether by private or the government investments to the, uh, the power plant places, because this is really the issues the issue on the digital divide. The brief free Wi-Fi for all aims to accelerate the Philippine government efforts in enhancing internet accessibility for Filipinos through the provision of the Wi-Fi access in public places and the uh, issues all over the country. As of December 28, as uh, if I may mention, the total of uh, more than 7,000 Live sites were established in 17 regions, 79 provinces, and around uh, less than uh, 1,000 municipalities and 120 cities nationwide. We have also this technology empowerment for education, employment, entrepreneurship, and economic development and what we call the Tech for Ed, a program that provides ICT-enabled services to communities that have uh, minimal access or no, or no access to ICT and government services which uh, we have around uh, less than 5,000 tech boards established as of today. The DICT seeks to establish also a good foundation of ICT statistics and is currently strengthening its capacity as well. In your study, uh, we uh, do uh, um, accept the importance of these indicators. To address data gaps in terms of ICT, the department embarked on a national data gathering initiative to generate indicators needed in monitoring and tracking the improvement of accessibility in use of ICT in the country. This initiative includes, for example, as I mentioned the earlier, we have this 2019 National ICT Household Survey, the Women and ICT Development Index Survey, and of course, the ITBPM Baseline Survey of 2021. The DICT is also currently implementing projects that further support the advancement of platform or online work such as the National Cybersecurity Plan, um, which seeks to institutionalize the adoption of information security governance and approaches 
passed through this, uh, we call the National uh, Computer Emergency Response Team of the Philippines, which uh, previously the US truly is the head of that CERT PH. Another notable effort of the department is the Digital Terrestrial Television Broadcasting Migration Plan Implementation, which is the comprehensive plan that addresses policy, regulatory, and technical issues involved in the country's migration to digital TV, which is also the ICT, and it's being led by the National Telecommunications Commission. To encapsulate the key takeaways of the, uh, the ICT from two discussions papers, the COVID-19 pandemic has recently changed the way we work and has sparked and transformed the demand and use of digital platforms to be able to support this. The government shall ensure the initiatives that promote meaningful use of ICT, such as digital workforce through ICT Academy, ITPP, scaling and Rescaling, digital jobs and ICT capability development in the countryside should be capitalized and harnessed. To enable this digital connectivity efforts, such as the IT National Broadband Program and Free Wi-Fi, as well as the digital transformation that shall be expeditiously implemented. For the country to be able to effectively assess participation in digital platforms, the government shall also leverage existing data collections, generation mechanisms, such as the National ICT Household Survey, and, the, uh, and by, by automating statistical system. For all of this to be achieved, a strong local, national, and international cooperation and collaboration is necessary so as the, the benefit of the advancement of online platform work as well as the realization of the digital dividends be equally felt and enjoyed by the Philippine people. As the last slides, let me share you some of the national data on the household access and individual uses of ICT related to the study. And uh, some of these are, uh, as you can see, only 17.7% of the households have their own internet access at home. Around 43% of individuals have usage in the internet and many of them have used the cell phone to connect to the internet. Majority or 76% of households do not have their own computer at home, while only 23.8% of the households have computer at home and so on. Uh, again, I uh, would like to, in behalf uh, of the, the, the ICT, would like to, to congratulate the PIDS, the team, for this study. And the, we will definitely make use of this study. And uh, this is very timely. This is, as, as I mentioned, we are currently updating our national broadband plan uh, as to, in our, uh, as to, to, to align the, uh, the, 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 what the government is doing in response to the pandemic issue. I think that will be my last slides and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And thank you to Director Tardio. Uh, we appreciate the ICT's uh, various initiatives on ICT capacity development, um, connectivity improvement and data collection. And clearly the results of the National ICT Household Survey leave, leave a lot to be desired for the country. Okay, so at this point, um, Ask if our uh, may ask our uh, presenters, Dr. Um, Kimba and Dr. Dakoykoy, if they have any points to the uh, comments of our discussions. Um, both of them have no did not raise any issues or did not raise any question on your presentation. Uh, in fact, they have uh, provided very useful recommendations. Would you have and do you have any response to this uh, comment? Uh, may I start, uh, Dr. Koy Koy? Would you have any response? None for me, Sheila. Okay. Uh, how about you, Dr. Kimba? We can't hear you. Um, please check your microphone. Right. So uh, uh, thank you again to both discussants, to uh, Dr. Chua and to Director Tardio for their uh, comments. I, I, I and I, I re, I'm really hopeful that the, the research that we did will be able to uh, support any policies that are relevant to addressing possible digital divides that may be brought about by the platform economy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Francis. Okay, uh, friends, before we proceed to the next part of our webinar, let us give our speakers a short break before they start answering questions. 
And uh, actually, we see some direct messages that they are waiting for the poll. I think they 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 missed the poll, no? So okay, a friend's wish granted. So are you ready? We have a. I, I selected a a a poll question from the presentation of Director Tardio. Okay, and here is the question. Thea, could you please? Okay. Uh, everyone is uh, encouraged to participate in this poll. So here is our question. According to the National ICT Household Survey, how many of the sample households have internet access at home and use the internet for social media and communication? Is it A, 43%, B, 23.8%, C, 17.7%, or D, 31.2%? Okay, uh, you may key in your answer now. Uh, you have five seconds to answer and... Uh, okay, so we now end our poll and I, I think Webex, Webex needs at least 20 seconds no, Thea, to, to process the results. So, is the result ready? Not yet. Seconds, okay. Okay. Friends, if you have questions, just uh, use the chat box and uh, we will be starting the uh, Q&A shortly. So we now have the re... Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. So the answer is C, 17.7% and 21 uh, got it right. So, okay, congratulations to... Uh, uh, those who got the answer right. So what we will do is we will pick two names from those who answered our poll correctly and each of them will get a PIDS notebook. And I will announce the winners before we close the open forum. Okay. So friends, let us now proceed to our Q&A. And at this point, may I invite our uh, presenters and discussants to join the open forum. So okay, let me just check our questions from the chat box. Okay, uh, let us start uh, from, okay, we have a question here from uh, Maria Lourdes Mendoza. Um, and she said, the trend I observe across the, across the date of two studies so far is that those who have uh, wealth and education enjoy more access and gains of the platform economy. So she's asking what interventions of the state can be recommended in order to help indigents and mar indigent and marginalized sectors. I think um, our presenters and our discussants already have uh, uh, enumerated some of some very useful recommendations, but uh, you may want to elaborate on this. Uh, Connie, would you like to um, answer this question? And later on, I will also ask Francis as well as um, our discussions. Uh, I think, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes. So uh, I have said you know, um, the, there are already some government initiatives, and I think Dr. Uh, Director Tardio already mentioned this as well. Yes. Uh, the DICT has uh, currently ongoing, has ongoing um, uh, initiatives and programs, like for example, most specifically is something that really is, uh, 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 resonate with me is the digital jobs page program because this is very specific marginalized community of intervention. Uh, the, the government is already doing uh, some intervention. The only question, so how do we make this, for example, um, regular and how do we make this thing? The, each program become uh, uh, bigger in terms of uh, reach, in terms of scope, and in terms of regularity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Francis, uh, would you like to add to what Cody uh, has just uh, mentioned? Uh, thank you, Sheila. Let me just uh, turn on my video. All right. So um, yes, uh, there are a number of um, initiatives already uh, being done by the government. And, and uh, Director Tardio has um, elaborated on these no, and has identified a number of things. Uh, I think one very important 
important uh, issue, and uh, Kevin has also mentioned this earlier in his uh, discussion, that we improve also material access. So the That's so right. material access we cover not just only having access to the physical item or of uh, computers or mobile phones, but also the the connectivity connecting to the network. Mm -hmm. And I think that the uh, one very important. Um, initiative there is the free Wi-Fi. You know? So mm -hmm. we have seen that um, the, our um, a number of the Filipinos access to the internet is through is not through a, a broadband at home, but through mm -hmm. through other um, options. And uh, we, we we want to um, improve access. And we, in terms we also want because uh, you know uh, Filipinos already have this sense of the importance of the internet. You know, not just in terms of um, TikTok and Facebook, but there's also there's also an appreciation of um, what it can do. You know? it can be a source of living, it can be a source of entertainment, and can even um, help them with their education. So, um, what is really important is uh, pushing for um, using or improving access, but. Let me also just mention that there is also this special segment of society, of, of Philippines in society, where they have limited access and appreciation of the internet. Our, um, uh, cl close to our hearts, our senior citizens tend to have higher levels of income, but their access and appreciation of the internet is quite low. And, and uh, as I've shown earlier, they tend to rely on indirect use indirect users mm -hmm. of the internet. They ask their children, they ask their helpers to uh, assist them in um, doing internet transactions. And we want to also engage this segment of the population to also participate in, in the digital platforms in digital, so that they won't also be left out. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. I, I agree with you very much. This pandemic has created greater awareness of the importance of, of the internet, of the importance of digital platforms. Um, in work, um, uh, education, in accessing services, no? Um, Kevin, uh, Dr. Shua, any interest that you would like to add to the conversation? Uh, thank you, Shia. So, uh, I would just like to echo the response of Dr. Connie and Dr. Francis on, on this one. So, basically, uh, to look at the hurdles to access uh, mm -hmm. The uh, material access, of course, is a very important component. It's uh, in remote and rural areas of the Philippines we have internet there. So, definitely, if you want to reach out to the marginalized of our society, you have to make sure first that this is system. So, looking at digital infrastructure, utilities, mm -hmm. you know, uh, towers, those things, so that we can deliver internet would be a prerequisite to participation to the digital economy. Uh, but beyond that, of course, uh, there are some programs with the government. Director already mentioned that those, those are really cool. We have to make sure that digital literacy is also on top of our mind in delivering to our uh, to our people. Uh, the uh, inclusion of uh, some ICT skills in the enhanced digital curriculum is a very good direction. Uh, when I, I think we tested, there are also some uh, programs there that is focused on also digital. So those are also some aspects to look at. So more than uh, so more than motivational, we also have to look at material access yeah, yeah. To, yeah, mm -hmm. to participation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you to uh, Dr. Chua. Doc Director Cardio, uh, well, we all agree that, you know, the, the various uh, initiatives uh, you mentioned being uh, uh, implemented by the DICT, these are all very relevant and useful. Um, in terms sir, of the progress of these uh, initiatives, you know, would you like to have I would like to share with us of, you know, because what we saw are um, the number, for example, not number of trained individuals, number yeah. of, uh, but, but uh, I think more than the numbers, we would be interested in the actual impact of, you know, this, let's say, capacity uh, development, digital connectivity initiatives. Yes, yes, um, yes, thank you, Sheila. Actually, uh, yes, especially during this pandemic, uh, what mm -hmm. is uh, in the positive side of uh, the, the DICT is uh, found out the very need of the uh, what we call this internet access. Uh, 
because the face-to-face -face, uh, the face-to-face -face, uh, transaction the face-to-face -face, uh, activities are very much limited and uh, and then are going most of this uh, through online or to this uh, what we call um, similar to this uh, to these activities and uh, we are not stopping uh, mm -hmm. we, we are continuously doing this as for the pre wi-fi uh, we are we are continuing this uh, implementation of national broadband plan although there may be some some but uh, the, the, the department is uh, currently uh, uh, continuing doing this. And uh, this impact, uh, there are lots of, uh, you know, uh, we, we have this cluster offices, regional offices uh, nationwide. And uh, what is happening happening uh, right now is uh, we do re, uh, uh, have some of their, their, uh, their experiences after attending this uh, webinar, seminars, then they have this, uh, this uh, you know some 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 uh, some uh, technical know-how of using the internet mm -hmm. in your study for example uh, even even the old ones don't know how to how to uh, how to use but the beauty of doing this online with their uh, you know, some some children some uh, daughters and sons at home and share so uh, well and the and the the, uh, the other uh, member of the societies can be able to attend. Uh, actually, that's the positive side of it. And uh, to, uh, to, uh, in addition, I forgot to mention some uh, the initiative in the common tower analysis uh, because I heard uh, the discussion the tower important on the uh, mobile platform. Thank you, very much. Thank you to uh, Director Tardio. So let's now go as a question from our from the audience. Uh, we have a question here from Mr. Don Agustin of the Masag Masaganang Sakahan. And uh, he's interested to know more than me about uh, the Singaporean model. I, I think he's referring to the skills future, whether this is applicable to, to fill in uh, agriculture. Perhaps you can tell us more about this, or uh, we can also ask Kevin later. Uh, this model of learning and uh, how I'm whether it's related to you know because I, I think uh, this is the uh, interest of Mr. Bruce because uh, he is uh, he works in a nonprofit uh, devoted to agricultural development and the welfare of uh, farmers. Connie, mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, if we if we take if we go we, if we are going to compare, uh, can you hear? Can you hear? Shana? Yes, yes. Although um, your Sorry. connection is choppy at some point. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. Um, how about now? Yes, it's okay so, now. You okay. So, okay. So, um, if we, we are going to compare the Singapore and the Philippines, there's a really big disparity. In fact, I just want to share that uh, pre-pandemic, I went, I was able to uh, go to Japan and meet some um, national experts there, and then. Uh, there's this Singaporean, and then he was uh, telling me that the Philippines is actually more fortunate than the Singapore in terms of natural resources, because mm -hmm. uh, we we have this vast um, uh, vast uh, that 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 we have this vast agriculture, and 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 the the Singapore you know, they are they are all building they're just an island state, and they even source their water uh, or at least some parts of their water from Malaysia. So in terms of, of, of compar com comparability, uh, we are not comparable. So that's why. But despite that, despite that, look at they are they, they are the Singaporean. They are able to do some underground farming. The, this, this national expert that I met in Japan, he was saying that they were able to raise vegetables underground and they're able to simulate the sunlight. Um, uh, in order to grow this plant. So how big is that? And is that even applicable here in the Philippines? Or is that even something that we can do in the near future? So that's why in terms of probably trying to come up with, uh, it, is this type of agriculture uh, uh, applicable to the Philippines? Maybe, but mm -hmm. the answer is no. But th th mm -hmm. that's why what, what I was trying to say earlier is that we don't have to to, we, we need to look at the best practices, we need to look at their experience and try to put that into con the, the Philippine context. How are they able to do it um, in the sense that, okay, 
Okay. So if they're able to do underground farming, it's probably not applicable to the Philippines, but they are able or product you can be able to put that in the context that is relevant to the Philippines. So I, I, I think that the, that we are putting uh, forward because the Singaporean experience and the skills future, this is something that is, uh, you know, it has some, some it, it's a system that, that is uh, successful and probably uh, the, the Singaporean experience, it, it may not be completely applicable to, uh, for us, and that is why we need to learn from them. What is it that we can get from their experiences mm -hmm. and be able to translate it into, uh, into the needs that is uh, something that is relevant to the context? Thank you. Thank you, Connie. And anything that you'd like to add, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Chua, how can we possibly? Uh, apply the Singaporean uh, model, skills future uh, model to capacitate our uh, farmers to better their lives? Thank you very much, and thank you, Sir Dan, for the question. Interesting one. But definitely, uh, same thing, same observation with Dr. Connie. For one thing, there's a big difference between Singapore and the Philippines. Singapore, they're not uh, being an island state. They're not in, big into agriculture. Mm -hmm. So if you see this skills program, this uh, skills future program, this is very well tailored and very specific to the case of Singapore. In mm -hmm. fact, if you look at the content of this one, what are they looking at? They're looking at lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. They're looking at a tailored programs that has a big component of digital, of digital, uh, digital uh, learning, state, data and analysis management all those things so i guess although there's a big disparity between uh the skills future program of singapore uh if one thing we can do is probably uh you know because general principles yeah are, are, general are good. principles so yeah general, so mm -hmm. i think that's something that we can also adopt even in agriculture things that's like maybe we should focus on lifelong learning it's right. like even farmers can still learn at this point the farmers right. can learn how to sell in lasada mm -hmm. how to sell mm -hmm. online maybe we could have some uh some programs on that one mm -hmm. also the, the focus on digital yes because technology is, digital technology is here to stay uh 10 mm -hmm. years from now it will not go away so the farmers should be prepared for that one too so i i think that's the key here getting the general principles from uh from this yes. skills future program yeah very good points dr uh, chua okay uh another question and this one is for you, Connie, from Mallory Joy Mones. Uh, she would like. She's asking if you could please elaborate on the issues of the on issues of the universal basic income that you shared in your in one of your messages. That is uh, designing a social protection system that covers all types of arrangements. Maybe you can uh, expound on uh, on the on this that you mentioned in your presentation, Connie. Mm, thank you. But universal basic income, actually, there uh, there is um, none yet. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, there we in terms of implementation, this is not yet implemented. No, this is just in the drawing board. Mm -hmm. So this is something that uh, that um, you re we really need to think about this because this universal basic in income is like you know giving uh, giving a certain level of income to uh, people who are. Uh, Sheila, can you hear? Yes, I can hear oh, you. Okay, we okay. can hear you, Connie. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so in the, this universal basic income, it's like giving a certain level of income uh, to people uh, as uh, some some sort of social protection, right? But uh, again, there are issues. Uh, she was asking for issues, right? So, uh, the, there are issues because the amount of the question is how much first. Uh, how mm -hmm. much money should we give uh, such that it's going to cover a certain level of decent living? Uh, so, in terms of uh, in terms of implementation, it's not yet implemented. It's still in the on the draw in the drawing board. Uh, people still have to think of, of how to go about uh, doing this because there are people who are saying, okay, how much money are you going to give? If you're going to 100 pesos or 500 pesos, is that even enough to cover a decent uh, living uh, standard of living? So, uh, so that is an issue. And and then the second issue is the crowding out. Um, are we prepared? Uh, do we have enough money to cover uh, giving this amount of uh, to, to to give to to give this uh, to call 
give this amount of money to certain people at, on a regular basis. So those are issues that we need to think about in terms of going about this universal um, basic mm -hmm. the fiscal uh, implications. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and at the same time, it sometimes be political. It can sometimes it can be used as as a political tool. So. Mm -hmm. Not, not this is just on the drawing board this is something that uh, we really need to think about uh, but there are issues uh, if you're going to create a social protection system uh, maybe we, we, we need to to craft uh, to cater it to our needs and then just look at the desirables the desirable features that we have um, uh, that we have compiled thank you yes. Connie Connie yes Okay, thank you very much. Connie. Yes, thank you very much, Connie. Uh, Kevin, uh, you work at the World Bank. Uh, is uh, the concept of uh, universal basic income on the rate of the bank? And uh, you perhaps you can uh, share something about it. Uh, thank you, Sheila. I'm not too familiar yet uh, with regards to uh, that topic in, inside the bank. Uh, I know that uh, only a few countries have been considered because of the uh, space to give uh, universal basic income. But right now, I haven't been hearing that uh, inside the bank, so I, I, I can't contribute a lot on that topic. It's okay. It's okay, uh, Kevin. Okay, let's now move to other questions. And uh, just a friendly reminder to our uh, Facebook uh, Live uh, viewers, you are also very much welcome to join the conversation. So if you have any questions, just Type in your uh, question using the comment section of Facebook. Okay, uh, we have a question from Luisita Marsan. Um, okay, okay, he asked. Uh, she asked, uh, "How how do inequalities due to asymmetries like risk and information can be applied to revert?" Uh, the detrimental and effects on work conditions among Filipino workers asserting employee rights such as occupational health and safety. Okay, uh, I think trying to, uh, okay, I think she's trying to ask about, you know, how, how these asymmetries can be, uh, help how can we address this uh, asymmetries for us to uh, improve um, occupational health and safety of our uh, workers? And uh, perhaps we can ask uh, the um, the insights of our uh, speakers. Anyone? Uh, Francis, can we may we hear from you this time? Uh, thank you, Sheila. And I'm I'm trying to. Um, piece together my, my response to, to this question. So it's okay. Uh, so what we what we see from, actually from I'm trying to recall from the study, um what were what were the asymmetries in, in risk and in information and how how does this affect um the divide? Um so what we see is that uh, there are groups of people uh, who are who are more familiar, who are more familiar with the internet and the risks involved, and who have a better level of understanding of the security, and that they are, and because of this, they have a better confidence, and they are now able to participate in the in the platform economy by um, doing more transactions, by taking on jobs and receiving income through digital payments, and um, and uh, so. Even um, you know, like, like contributing some videos and um, in a more active participation in the platform economy. So, um, and on the other hand, you know, we see that there are the other, on the other side where there are people who have uh, lower skills, and so they only just participate in the less um, productive uh, side of the platform economy. And you know, the, these are the ones that I have um, um, focusing more on entertainment and uh, sending emails, but. Uh, the one that's productive, the one with, that you would actually get paid, are you're you're not really particip They're not really participating there. So that's the 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 situation there in terms of of 
um, the, the the asymmetry. And then we, we, what we want to see is that, um, so we want uh, a certain group of people, those who are actually participating, to be able to, um, what do you say this, um, assert their employee rights. Right. So I think that would be closer to what um, what Connie presented, you know, so the, the mm. participation in the digital platforms. So, but what, but I guess what is important here is that, you know, there is an understanding of the risks involved, the, the and um, what we want. What what we want to do, as Kevin has mentioned, is that the government should be able to provide a an environment where people can actually participate in the platform economy, in the digital economy, with confidence that there is an a, a, an agency that they can approach in case that there's um, uh, issues related to their security and um, um, and risk. So uh, I guess that would be my my response. I, I hope I, I was able to respond to, to the question. Yes, yes, you yes, did. Yes. Okay. Um, um a co-author of uh, Dr. Dakuikoy is uh, part of this uh, Q and A panel, Dr. Ordeta. Would you have any thoughts as to uh, how we can address this information asymmetry to provide uh, better working conditions for our online platform? Uh, yeah, the, the, sorry for, the issue really is, 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 uh, there is sometimes the solution, technological solution is really ratings, uh, uh, people use ratings for both uh, for both uh, what do you call this for both uh, the provider as well as the buyer. So mm -hmm. they both have ratings. The ratings is supposed to to be a, a a tool for trying to to a certain quality uh, as a provider as a, and as a as a as a buyer uh, that does that so the, the 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 provider rates his employer mm -hmm. as well as the employee rates his buyer so, and that rating is being uh, uh, utilized by both uh, the like for example if your employer you would like to do the ratings of what to you of the, of the provider and that, that's one. and that's that's, I think, the technological solutions. Aside from that, of course, it's the normal solutions of, of, of uh, what you call these uh, certifications. But that's, mm -hmm. that involves uh, more infrastructure. So I think the people now, because you don't need a special infrastructure like certifications uh, to, to, to implement certifications, uh, it's really the rating thing. So. Uh, of course, the problem with the rating is that uh, you have to have several iterations of that to get a good rating, because people can be nasty in terms of uh, personal. But if you have several people uh, providing ratings, then by law of uh, averages, you will have a good, a good uh, indication of the quality. So that's that's basically. Uh, I think the, the way that uh, you can address this uh, asymmetric information between buyers and sellers in terms of okay. So mm -hmm. I think that's the thing that I can think of in terms of certifying uh, quality of both uh, the provider of services and the buyer of services. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Orbeta. Okay, we have another question here from Paolo Miguel or Ordonio. This is a bit... Um, a general question. Uh, after a year of the pandemic and community quarantine, what have we learned from the evolving digital divide issues? And what are the best practices made to cure these issues? Or perhaps we can um, get a uh, first response of uh, Dr. Uh, Director Tardio. Would you like to uh, answer this first? Any, yes. any um, lesson? Yes, uh, learning from this uh, pandemic when it comes to the evol evolving digital divide. I think 
we have uh, mentioned uh, a bit of those in in your in your presentation yes. and in your remarks earlier. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sheila. Probably we have uh, learned a lot to uh, with this pandemic. Uh, uh, particularly, you know, uh, I handled in the last year's pandemic. I handled the uh, the, the, the national computer emergency response mm -hmm. team in the Philippines, and we we receive a lot of incident reports. Uh, issue on Facebook, issue on online activities, a lot of them. So the lessons learned here is the government should be really, really prepared for that uh, for that um, incidents. And uh, as I said uh, earlier in my presentations, the government has this cybersecurity management system platform that's uh, just started last year, so very timely on the pandemic. So lessons learned, we should be very, very uh, uh, prepared on that. And also, uh, lessons learned is that uh, without uh, maybe the positive side of it, uh, without pandemic, we cannot just uh, feel the very uh, necessity of every Filipinos to have the internet access at home. Because mm -hmm. uh, whether you are not working or not, uh, uh, as you heard, we have a lot of work from home uh, approach in, 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 in the industry. And uh, I would like to add uh, the previous uh, questions uh, to to have some 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 solution on the asymmetric uh, risk. What the government is doing is, you know, we have issued a lot of applications, online applications or systems such, such as the Stay Safe uh, apps that everybody can use, uh, whether to monitor their health, uh, as to the safety of their family, and that's very very useful for them. So I think the government is doing that for the Filipino people and also for the workers. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila. And thank you to um, Director Tardio. Okay. Uh, our other uh, part, um, speakers, do you have anything to add to what the, uh, Director Tardio mentioned? Otherwise, we will go to um, our next uh, question. And actually, we have a comment here from Antonio Avila. And it's, this pertains to social protection. Let me just read it. Um, he said, since most BPO workers are working on graveyard shift, they experience a lot of health problems, hence the mandatory coverage of health insurance is important even if employment is contractual. Although scholarships for upskilling or reskilling should be made available by the employer or the government. Actually, uh, we have a sort of a follow up to our conversation today on social protection. We will have another um, webinar on, on this topic. On so mainly on social protection, as well as other uh, related uh, issues is going to be on May 27 and Dr. Uh, Connie. Dr. Connie Dakoykoy will also be uh, the speaker um, in, in this webinar, right, Connie? Yes, yes that's, go yeah. that's going to be on, on, on May 27. Okay, uh, uh, other questions? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, Francis, yes. go ahead. Can we just uh, go back to that question on what we have learned? Um, yes, please. Yes. Okay. So, um, I, I'm Kevin and I met each other in a another forum. No? So, and I I was a discussant, naman for there, <laughs> on the it was the other side of the coin. But, um, in my intervention there, I remember talking about uh, digitization as, uh is indeed part of the heart of the COVID response for a number of countries. Mm. And what we have seen is that there are a number of countries, like for example, China, Singapore, and Taiwan, and the USA, that have applied uh, um, dashboards uh, that can be used to track the disease activity in real time. We have also seen um, digital technology that was utilized for contract tracing, including GPS systems, mobile phone applications, real-time monitoring, uh, in, and these were done in Germany, Singapore, and South Korea. So what we have learned is that we can actually use um, uh, all these um, technology and uh, these are available and these can we should actually maximize these available technologies for for the COVID response. And uh, as 
essentially also what we need to see is that uh, digital economy, we, we also need to look at digital integration. Mm -hmm. So because participating in digital economy, our rules, regulations will have to be in line with what is happening in the international um, setting because uh, what the digital trade or is allowing that our goods services are actually now being transport transported and uh, we, we are actually accessing a wider market so um at the heart also of a uh, of all these things that uh, as part of our covid response is that we should also uh, look at um our regulation and the harmonization of rules and standards with those of our partners uh, in the region so those two things should also be uh, considered um, in our in what we have learned in this um, community quarantine in the pandemic. Thank Very you. good points, uh, Francis. If I may also uh, ask uh, uh, Dr. Chu what to share his lessons from this uh, pandemic. I think it is this uh, question is is really worth. Uh, uh, it's worth uh, the additional minutes. <laughs> So, so we can uh, better, you know, uh, understand uh, th this this issue that we are into. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Sheila. So, just quickly, uh, one of the key things is that is that we know that the pace of digitalization has accelerated during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, people are being forced now in firms to adopt uh, some of the uh, some digital platforms to sell their products, and even uh, house uh, individuals to use uh, online platforms, digital payments. To move money, let's say employers sending uh, money, uh, wages through uh, online and those things. So we definitely know that uh, digitization is on the acceleration. Uh, but but you know it's still difficult when it comes to digital to the issue of digital divide because we know some people are still that behind. For example, if we uh, in the Ayuda system, uh, we know that some people still line up to get their uh, to get uh, the, uh, the the social protection from the government because uh, we cannot fully use uh, digital platforms because some people just don't have access to it. So I think, uh, in terms of learnings, we know that this is something that's happening right now, digitalization, it's coming in the future more strongly. I think it's, it's up to uh, to make sure that we uh, address all the hurdles to access so that more of us can capitalize on the opportunities, these development opportunities. In fact, the problems that we have when it comes to uh, doing getting uh, specific or uh, uh, data mm. uh, answers is that you cannot do face-to-face -face interviews these days. Right. Difficult containment measures. So, but mm. then if you do some, you uh, collect surveys via let's say uh, digital platforms, then that alone means that uh, uh, only a few, uh, only a segment of society will respond to that survey. Mm -hmm. So getting specific, specific data is still difficult these days That's because right. of this kinds of limitation. Mm -hmm. And I think the PIDS is also uh, experiencing uh, the, same. The, the same issues, no, uh, Francis and Kwati. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Kevin. And, and Connie, uh, if I may also ask your, your uh, learnings, the lesson uh, from this pandemic that you may want to share to our audience. Hi, Sheila. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for including. So I, I think what I just want to say is I agree with uh, Director Tardio and with Francis and uh, Kevin that we really need to be prepared. Uh, and then the, not only uh, because of the digital divide, but I think for other attendant issues. One is uh, we need to be prepared because cybercrime has increased and this needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Second, there are inequalities in access, especially in education. Um, child, uh, I mean, um, based on the ICT household survey, how many households have access to internet, and how, and and, and and you will just think how many children are are not being able to participate in online learning because they do not have mm -hmm. access to internet. And the number, and then the last one would be probably uh, the digitization of micro, small, and medium enterprises. That's so right. the digitization is very important, especially for these enterprises, because they really need to have visibility and presence not only in the globe, not only in the local uh, market, but also in the global market. And that, that that's one way. A digitization is one way to help them to achieve this uh, visibility. I think that's that's my learning from uh, the pandemic. Thank you very much, Connie. What better way to 
recap uh, this uh, Q&A share all the lessons that uh, we have learned from this pandemic. So I thank our uh, speakers for, for their response. So what did we learn from today's webinar? Well, a lot of things. If there is one for the takeaway, this is the fact that uh, as, as we've uh, learned from the presentation, digital platforms can be a, a double-edged sword, no? Um, digital platforms have significant positive effects and we've heard what those effects are in our webinar last March 11. They have facilitated the convergence industry, they generate sub generate substantial revenues for the government, for the economy, and they help create jobs. But as we have heard today, digital platforms may also have consequences as they are highly selective of particular sections of the population. Um, platforms favor the scale, those with uh, access to, to technology and those that are located in affluent areas. And we've also uh, heard in the presentations women are, are, are also drawn to platform work given the flexibility it gives. So ever, while platform work gives them employment opportunities, they have no guarantee of secure income flows and social protection. And this could aggravate um, gender disparities in social protection coverage. So also, as what Dr. Dokoikoy uh, has emphasized, platform workers classified as contractors or self-employed are also at a, at a disadvantage as they are not likely to have security benefits and uh, protection entitlements. So if these issues are not addressed, the platform economy could exacerbate existing inequality disparities and ensuring that our digital platforms are inclusive and accessible to everyone is, is very crucial. Strategies that uh, promote social protection, coverage, job security, and skills development are also essential to ensure that everyone benefits from the platform economy and no one is left behind. Friends, please join me in thanking our presenters and discussants for the insights that they share with us this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Dakoy Koy, Dr. Uh, Francis Kimba, uh, Dr. Ordeca, Director uh, Kevin Shua, and Director George Cardio for your participation. Let us give them a big virtual clap. Okay. And friends, before we finally close, I would like to announce the two winners of the, uh, the, of the our two poll winners who will be the PIDS notebook. They are Katrina Cabana, Cabana and Vicente Camilon. Camilon. I repeat, Katrina Cabana and Vicente Camilon. You are today's winners, and uh, our uh, webinar team will contact you for the delivery of your prize. And finally, friends, we have some reminders. Um, Yes, you may get copies of the presentations from the PIDS website and also flash on the screen are the links to the full studies of Dr. Kimba and Dr. Dakuikoy. Also, uh, please help us improve our webinars by answering our survey. It will pop on your screen once you have um, uh, close uh, WebEx and we will also email you the link and uh, please do Regularly visit our website and follow us on our social media pages. Again, thank you to all who uh, um, tuned in to our, um, who uh, followed us on Twitter and also, and also uh, uh, watched our live stream on Facebook. And for April, we have three uh, webinars. We have three remaining webinars for this month. On April 15, we will we will have another webinar on digital platforms. This time we will uh, talk about cross-border regulatory issues. On April 22, we will have a break from um, our discussion of digital platforms. And we will, the topic will be assessing national government support programs for LGUs and water service delivery. And on April 29, we will have uh, we will talk about uh, the country's expanded immunization program and primary health care for non-communicable diseases. And finally, we would like to thank um, all our, um, all the representatives from the government, from um, the private sector, 
from the academe and from civil society, even from the media who participated in this webinar today. Maraming maraming salamat po. And we hope to see you again in our future webinar, future webinars here at PIDS. So friends, this concludes our webinar for this week. Thank you so much again for joining us and we hope to see you next week. Let us all stay safe and healthy and stay informed to enjoy the rest of your day. Maraming salamat po. Bye everyone. Thank you for attending. Thank you very Thank much. You everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks everyone. Stay safe.